This is Conspiranormal. All right, guys, welcome back to Conspiranormal. And we are here, and we have a special guest on the line, and that's Seth Breedlove. And we are going to talk about his new series about UFOs that he has coming out. But Seth, uh, welcome to Conspiracy Normal, man. It's been a long time coming. I'm really glad to have you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. I'm glad you guys. Uh, I'm glad you guys enjoy our stuff. You said yeah. you, you said you've seen um, Flatwoods. That's that's one I of have my seen trip. Flatwoods. Yep. Yeah, that that's one of my. That's one of my babies. There's, there's like some, there's a few that are, that I just, once they're done, I stay connected to them. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's like Beast of White Hall, Flatwoods. I think Momo, I'm still really invested in Momo. Like mostly just cause the, the creative experience was so much fun, but Flatwoods and, and White Hall for sure have always been t two of the ones where I, I'm very, I just never really let go of them. Whitehall, especially, which I actually just rewatched like a week ago, um, mostly so I could stop my computer from crashing. I had to play something, so I just put on Whitehall <laughs> and let it play. And um, and uh, I was watching it as it was playing. I was like, "This isn't terrible for being like for for being like the first thing that I ever <laughs> shot." Um, and the first, the first movie I edited, because a lot of people don't realize that about Minerva, I I really had nothing creatively um i i the minerva was such a you know like we were just starting out and with minerva um i had i basically just kind of like pointed it at things and said you could shoot that and then the guy holding the camera would shoot something and then you know i do it i ran the interviews and asked the questions and then i tried to d sort of direct the editing process through note taking but that drove me crazy about that entire process on minerva so when we got to whitehall i wanted i wanted the all the all the all the balls in my court i wanted to yeah i wanted to be able to film it i wanted to be able to um to edit it and i wanted to to be able to steer the ship more so that was the first one where i really did any of that and i taught myself i actually taught myself editing doing the behind the scenes featurette that was on the minerva monster documentary that was technically the first thing i edited really? and then i cool. and then i made this little and then i made this little like short film about my dad that came out uh, that i entered in a film competition so are you primarily kind of like self taught with oh, yeah. editing and filmmaking yeah there's no there's nothing i mean i i I, I was asked I get asked a lot anymore about like I've taught filmmaking workshops now and stuff like that and and uh I always think it's kind of silly because you really like anyone can can learn this stuff if you are willing to invest the time and you don't get to the point where you think you're good like it it really comes down to just realizing I'm not good at this and and I've got to get better and I'm always trying to get better I spend um like an hour or two of every day still uh, either watching tutorials or reading mm -hmm. something about filmmaking um, every, every single day. So you, you know, like I, I'm definitely self-taught and we're always trying, like it's maybe that's like w one of the reasons why the movies change tone from, from project to project, maybe not tone, but they change style yeah. from, from project to project. Some of that is just like, I'm learning different things. And as I'm learning those things, I'm trying to incorporate it into what yeah. we're doing. So like, yeah. so like with, with, um, with beast of Whitehall, I knew I wanted like this, like David Fincher esque editing style that I had never done before. And, and honestly, I kind of hate that editing style. Hmm. And, uh, so I, I taught myself how to edit like that so we could edit that movie to feel more modern. And then we did it again with, with, on the trail of UFOs, like on the trail of UFOs, I went and watched a lot of, um, Oh God, I just realized this is probably incredibly boring to listen to. No, it's um, actually, it's fascinating uh, actually. Okay. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's yeah. always good to under, you know, but somebody like yourself that just picked up a camera decided, yeah. Hey, I want to do this. The DIY know? attitude. We yeah. Really appreciate. I mean, yeah. We appreciate that for sure. I mean, that's what cool. podcasting is all about. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So with, with, with uh, on the trail of UFOs, I watched a lot of like YouTube vloggers and stuff like that because um, you know guys like Casey Neistat and 
and Levi Allen and um, Peter McKinnon, they, they all do that, that like very specific type of like quick cutting. And it's not something I, that, that editing style is not something I particularly love to do. In fact, I would say at times it's like pulling teeth for me, but I thought for this project it was needed because I wanted this to feel of the moment. You know, I, right. I didn't, I like, I like the fact that on the trail of Bigfoot is this sort of like measured, um, not slow paced, but like, you know, like the, the average cut on, on the trail of Bigfoot is like six seconds long probably. And on the trail of UFOs, it's like two, two, two seconds long. Like we're, we're in and out of every shot at like a rocket pace. Um, and much I think more, that's, much more the frenetic kind of editing yeah. style. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of, I kind of like just constantly changing it up like that. And, and, and it keeps things interesting for me too, because if I'm going like, I mean, this year we're going to edit four different projects. Um, by the time it's all over, we'll have, we'll have edited. And it was supposed to be three, uh, because on the trail of UFOs was actually supposed to finish up in December, but we were still working on it. Um, you know, like two weeks ago. <laughs> so, Oh man, that light. Yeah. I noticed the ones that you, uh, that you sent me the, 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 those links. Um, it, it just, and when it's over, you don't have any credits. So I noticed right. that some of that stuff hasn't, hasn't been added in yet. Yeah. We just wrapped that. That, that was what I was working on like last week. Um, so man. yeah, we, we, we go, you know, we go pretty, f- we have, we have so many, we have such a weird turnaround and it's, it's like one of those things about the way we operate. That's also hard to explain to, to people who work within the normal, like even within the normal indie film sphere, because we're not even operating on those terms. We're doing, we're essentially a fully functioning independent production house that where like all the projects are being edited by one maniac. And the maniac is, is me. <laughs> right. So like, right. So like that's, you know, like we, we had meetings last week with a, with a big uh, distributor in Hollywood. And I was trying to explain that to them. I'm like, we have multiple productions per year. Um, two, two of them are going to be feature films, but then there's going to be like episodic content. We're putting out an eight episode miniseries about UFOs. Uh, we're doing, uh, this like special 90 minute long on the trail of like special that's about the Lake Michigan Mothman. Um, and it's all done, you know, it's all being edited by me. So we're in the, the big goal for the future is to bring in someone full time to the staff who would help me with that. And that would also, you know, we'd be, we'd be able to, I would be able to oversee the content we're putting out, but we could put out more content. Um, so that's kind of where we're looking in the future. Yeah. I, I want to talk a little bit about where you started. I mean, how you got started doing this, what, uh, what kind of drove you to say, Hey, I want to make a film yeah. about crypt about, about mysterious creatures. Like what, uh, how did that start for you? I was, um, so I, I've, I worked a number of jobs in my life. I've worked, um, I was a FedEx driver for like three weeks. Uh, I, I, I worked, uh, the, the, uh, I was what they call a package handler. No jokes guys. Uh, I was a package handler for FedEx on the, on the loading docks for, I think I lasted there for like four days. That's not an uh, easy thing to do, man. That's, that's the yeah, worst I've, job. I've done that too. Having, yeah. I had on my first day, I spilled, uh, some sort of acid down inside my shoe that like ate away my skin. And when I got off work, and went home and took my sock off. It like peeled an inch inch of like hey. just a gaping wound in my foot. That was like my first day on that job. But I've done all sorts of stuff. I've like repossessed homes, you know, where you go into people's houses with a gun and you're like, you've got to get out of here because you never paid your bills and you got the sheriff with you and all that stuff. I've done that. I've um I've did done landscaping and anyway, at the at the time when I got into like the paranormal, I was doing medical billing. Um, and then on the side, I was doing freelance re- reporting for local newspapers. I've always been a, a writer, um, and so I was doing freelance reporting. And I had a column called Slice of Life where I would write about independent businesses um, around Stark County in Ohio. And um, so we were. I, I was doing that stuff and uh, I got into the paranormal and started listening to a lot of podcasts because I was doing this medical billing job. And 
and that was pretty much it. I don't have like some sort of crazy story about like seeing Bigfoot or anything like that that got me into this. I just I gained an interest in the subject and um and and I would listen to shows about it and then I started reading books about it and and then I started having ideas about how I would like to see these subjects approached. And um the way I wanted to see it approached I hadn't I guess I hadn't seen it approached in the way that we were doing. So we, um, I put together a book proposal called small town monsters. That was going to be a case book about all these different, you know, rural monster cases around the United States. And we submitted it to a bunch of different publishers and none of them accepted it in a few months passed. And we ended up taking one of the cases that was in the book that I had actually done a lot of research into um, to the point where I had conducted like some phone call interviews and stuff with some of the people that were involved in the initial case. We turned that into our first movie, which was Minerva Monster. Um, and it was pretty much just like we – I never – it's weird. I never thought about Minerva Monster in the, in the production of it. I never thought about it as we're making a movie. Um, it was just like this – it was this thing. It was like a project. It was a creative project I was doing with some friends. I thought of it more of like, as, as like journalism. Yeah. Like like documenting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like visual journalism that I ever did a movie. And it wasn't until we did the, the uh, premiere in Minerva and 1200 people showed up that I, I was like, I I had this surreal moment where I came out of the theater. uh, Someone, I was like inside the theater taking tickets and someone's like, you got to go outside and see what's happening out there. So I like walked out and they were lying down the block, like around the block. And it looked like st- <laughs> like friggin' Star Wars <laughs> screening <laughs> or something. Like, it's the most, this is the most ridiculous. We've never had anything like it since. And we've had some really crazy screenings, but we never had anything on those levels again. And, uh, and it was at that moment I was like, oh, we made a movie. Like these people are all here to watch a movie, like not just – not just visual journalism or whatever highfalutin thing I had decided this was. And then, and then like, that was also the moment where I was like, man, you know, like we're not giving them what they're going to want. <laughs> Cause like they're going to go in and watch Minerva monster. And it's a, you know, it's a very like ground level look at, at a Bigfoot case, but there's none of the fun sort of like Bigfoot stuff in it. And um, for some people that's like, the reason they like it. Um, but for others, it's like, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff missing from it that they're, that they're, they're not going to get because of the fact that, you know, we didn't do any recreations or anything. So we, I also think that's sort of the point too, where I started to think about the future and what we could do down the road, you know, it's like bringing in more of an exciting visual aspect to, to what we do. Cause it is funny. The reason we made Minerva, and Whitehall and Boggy Creek the way we did with like no recreations, very, 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 very much just like a standard sort of like PBS doc. The reason we did that is because we, we didn't have any, any money. Like we, I mean, right. we still don't really like even, right. even though the Kickstarters and all that do, do well, we're, we're punching well above our weight. With recreations your, were not going to look that good is what you're no, saying. They were, right? Yeah, it was going yeah. to be bad news. Think, think of... Guy in a gorilla I, suit, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen our like our Momo movie, but like in that movie... I've not seen int- Momo. Yeah. I, I've okay. seen that one. Yeah. Okay, in Momo, like we intentionally did did the hokey. Like, yeah, you make, it a, you make it about like a, a, a fake film, right? Yeah, like you use yeah. A, like the, a bad Yeah, you pretend you find this film and, and do that. Yeah. And make it fun like that. Yeah, but it, but but the problem was like you can't. We were we were portraying those movies are stone cold serious, you know, as they should be. Like that's that's the way they are. Um, and if you all of a sudden had a had a guy in in like that Momo type suit running around, it's going to completely ruin the effect of the movie. <laughs> so so we just never did it. So anyway, yeah. The the long the long story short would would just be that I was working medical billing and I was real bored and I I wanted to to tell the Minerva monster story and visually was the only way that I had to do it where I knew we could get an audience. And, and, and the, the real secret there is that when, while, while Alan was off editing Minerva monster, I was spending six to eight hours of my day contacting media and doing stories about Minerva monster in, in the local press. And the story blew up 
regionally. I mean, here in Ohio, that was a a big deal for for a while, where every every newspaper, every radio station was doing something about Minerva Monster. And by the time that's why twelve hundred people showed up in Minerva to watch it. Like by the time the movie came out in May, that press deluge started somewhere around January. By the time it came out in May, it had been building for five months. People wanted to watch this movie that people were talking about on the radio they didn't realize it was made for like 200 bucks by some guys who'd never done anything you know 200 bucks awesome wow if i don't even know if it costs that much and really i've said i've said before it's somewhere between like a hundred dollars and five hundred dollars um but if you really like if you if you took out like paying for gas to drive out to minerva or we we didn't do anything. We didn't spend any money on anything. The only money we put into it was after the movie was done when we we had to um you know get DVDs and stuff printed. I think the only money we spent was on our artist, um, Matt Harris. And I think he made two hundred bucks. Wow. That's that's amazing, Seth. I had no idea that that's that's really amazing. Yeah. If you got the right equipment, you can do it. And and that's like that's the thing that we're where we are um that we're doing right now with like our you know of course the podcast but then like our like our our conference that we're doing like we're kind of we're i've seen a lot of conferences just kind of like just start from like just let's just get everybody famous in the world that you could possibly get Mm -hmm. and then they go into like an extreme amount of debt yeah you know we lost money on strange realities first one we did but we but we had extreme though we had it was an extreme we had some connections and we were able to use them. Cut and, corners. Yeah. And, and just starting off from like, just like, like planting a seed and mm-hmm. then just l- b- letting it blossom from there. I think that that's the important thing. And a lot of people, I think they just want to, they want to make sure everything is, is right. Everything's totally perfect. But like what you did is kind of like what we've done with podcasting is like, you start off like, you know, it doesn't sound the best. It doesn't mm-hmm. look the best, but you build on that. You build on that effort. Oh yeah, yeah, and you'll never. I, I think if you want to be successful, you ne- you never stop building on that effort either. Because like, I mean, every I hear a lot uh, from people like they watch our stuff and every. Well, I don't know how you do it. Like every project looks better than the one before it, and I'm always like, well, I mean that's true, but we're like we're. I always say we're 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 what we're doing is good for is great for for you know what we're working with with for like budgets and stuff but i don't i don't ever really want to settle with like for for like okay we're we're solid for what we're working with for a budget i want to be better than than corbell i want to be better than i want to be better than orson wells (laughs) like if we can (laughs) if we can just keep if we can just keep working uh, and real, you know, like always see that the, uh, I have, I have a talent for like always seeing the negative and, and when we, and that's not a talent really, but it can be. And when, when we come out of one of our movies, I'm always just like, ah, crap. Like I botched this, I botched that, I botched this. We got to fix that, that, this and the other thing when we're done. But you're right. Like anyone, it, it all comes down to like the will to keep going and, and learning as you're going. I mean, oh, Minerva we made for a couple hundred bucks but keep in mind like we didn't have to go anywhere Minerva's 20 minutes from where you know 30 yeah. 35 minutes from where I live now um I had already done all the research we talked to the people and we didn't put any money into the equipment cuz we had the money what's crazy to me is we we made Beast of Whitehall for probably less than $1500 and that movie was going to the Adirondacks um getting all these people involved that had never heard of us before um talking to people who'd completely sworn off ever discussing that case again um uh, and then learning it all as we were going completely i mean in, including i edited that whole movie on adobe premiere elements which is basically like the the baby the baby version of adobe premiere um so it was it was th- that one always amazes me too because actually honestly the first the first four everything up through Mothman when I look at our budgets and I guess even into well heck all of them but everything up through Invasion I look at and I can't believe we managed to pull pull it off on like the budgets we had I think we made in, in, Inva- Invasion for for like uh, 
Invasion on Chestnut Ridge was made for under five thousand. So they're all yeah. they're all crazy low budgets for for what we're managing to pull off. That one that one was that one was really really good. I really enjoyed that one. That was um I heard you on uh, Where to the Rodeo talking about it. Mm-hmm. And that's been one of those cases, man, that uh San Gordon stuff is material anyway. It's just interesting as hell, but that's one of the weirdest like yeah. you've got you've got everything in that. You got you, could do, you got UFOs. I mean it's everything. I, I keep telling Stan I could do a I could do an episodic series like about about the Chestnut Ridge and each episode focus on yeah. a different whacked out case. I mean on the on the trail of UFOs, I I, I think it's episode three or four, Stan tells the story out of nowhere. And he just tells it so matter of factly and it involves these like floating spheres in the sky with like going in and out of a cloud and one of them has like spikes coming off of it. And he just tells the story like it's totally, totally normal. Yeah. Well, he's so used to it. I mean, he's heard it so many times, but like the, there is that one where like, uh, the UFO comes down or whatever flying sauce or whatever. And the Bigfoot gets out and they got him phasing through reality. And, mm-hmm. you know, just that Ridge reminds me of someplace like, you know, um, Skinwalker, Skinwalker. Ranch, yeah. you know, it's like, one of those areas where this like really high strange areas yeah. did you find that when you're doing all this stuff because a lot of, all a lot of your um material is from the eastern united states mm-hmm. and did you find that and i've talked to, about this a lot did you find that a lot of the material that you dealt with especially when it came to like bigfoot was really weird that there was a really weird quality to a lot of it no no and like I, 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 Besides just that ridge, I guess. Yeah, it, it just isn't. Like, it, if if anything, what I find is that it's you know that is a very that makes up a tiny, a tiny percentage of of the overall volume of reports. It doesn't mean you write those reports off, but it does. You know, like I, I the, the thing I always turned I I asked uh, Don Keating, um, who's who's like the OG Ohio Bigfoot guru, right? Like he started in the in the late seventies investigating Bigfoot reports and carried on all the way into the early, um, actually into the late two thousands, even the early, early 2010s. Um, and I asked him like, you know, of, of the percent, uh, what was the number or volume of reports that you took that involved some weird, you know, slightly paranormal aspect to them? And he said zero, like in, in all the years investigating reports, and taking reports, he never took a single call that was like someone saw a Bigfoot walk into a portal or, hmm. but, you know, on the yeah. other hand, you talk to someone like Stan Garrett, or Stan Garrett, uh, Stan Gordon. <laughs> and, you know, like, that's like, that's par for the course for him. So I don't know if that comes down to a regional thing, you know, where people are not either not seeing it or just not reporting it in Ohio as much, or if it's, you know, if, if Stan is just more. Maybe people feel, feel uh, like it's easier to, to talk to Stan about some of the weirder aspects of their case. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, the, the number of reports that that I look at when it comes to Bigfoot that involve really strange stuff, it, it's kind of isolated to that area uh, on, the, on the ridge. And then you'll get scattered – here and there you'll hear stories every now and then um while we were making on the trail of ufos actually uh there's a story in in episode three um that sean forker and uh alexander petikov tell and they kind of go back and forth because they both witnessed strange uh strange stuff happening on this one property and again it's pennsylvania but it's not chestnut ridge area it's more toward like central uh eastern pa um and they both were there investigating Bigfoot reports, but ended up witnessing like some really strange activity, like like weird flashes in the night and people seeing humanoid figures in the woods. And then uh, and then Alexander actually saw a, a UFO and captured really uh, cool uh, video footage of it. That's in episode. Uh, what is that? Episode three or episode four? I can't remember. I think it's three. I think it's episode three. Um but yeah, there's, there's, it just doesn't the the volume of reports that involve weird activity. It's it's not very high when I'm when I'm looking at it. And again, that doesn't mean you write off the ones that are weird. It's just 
the the largest number are are pretty quote unquote mundane. Yeah, yeah, that's another aspect of it too. Is like the, there's a mundane aspect to all this stuff as well. Um, mm. I mean, Bigfoot is weird enough. I mean, let's just face it. Because I mean, you, when you've got you know this big hairy ape running around in the woods, in especially in the eastern United States, where right. you know there's small towns everywhere, yeah. urban urban centers. You know, as so you just think, you know, how in the world is this creature living out here? I mean, right. that that in and of itself is weird enough. Yeah. Um, but let's let's talk about on the trail of the UFOs. Um, one of the things I like that you do in your your documentaries is that you you bring a lot of people in that are experts in the field, and you have them as like as either part of it or as like a narrator or a host. Like you did that. Uh, one of them was it Momo? I think you did with Lyle Blackburn. Was that yeah, right? We've done, yeah, we've done like um, we've Lyle's narrated a bunch, but as far as being on camera, he's on camera in Boggy Creek Monster and Momo. Yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah, uh, Boggy Creek is kind of his thing. Yeah, and, and yeah. on on the trail of UFOs is coming out when uh, March twentieth is the official release date. Cool. Although there's a, there's a meeting. Uh, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say anything. We have a meeting tomorrow that could potentially push it back. It wouldn't push it back for our like our Kickstarter backers because they're they're promised to get it by that release date. But there's there's a we've been talking to a distributor who's really excited about trying to do a wide release for this. And if they decide to go with that, um, it could potentially push push it back, you know, a month or something like that. I'm not sure. But the plan is, you know, March 20th. Oh, okay. Yeah, nice. And it seems like this is marking uh you guys are are branching out from the the stuff in the past seems to be more focused on like crypto stuff and now uh you you guys are doing the UFOs and then you even have a a bell bell witch one coming up later. Yeah, I think if the plan is to just kind of keep doing subjects that are, that are interesting to us at the time. So, yeah. you know, like I I don't ever foresee us getting completely away from like cryptid stuff. And actually I just announced that, that we'll, we'll be starting production for, um, on the trail of Bigfoot season two, um, cool. over the next couple months, we're doing a big, it's going to, the, I don't know if it's going to be the first expedition, but we're going to, uh, British, the coast coast of, uh, British Columbia, uh, in August to film for that. So, so we're going to, we're, we're definitely going to stay in the cryptid realm, but, um, but yeah, we we are doing on the trail of UFOs, um, which we've dabbled in UFOs before. Like you know, Flatwoods is a UFO story. Mothman has UFO elements, invasion. Um, Momo even has has some of that in there. But um, we we wanted to do uh, UFO, and then uh, Bell Witch was was mostly because one of one of the um, the guys on the crew, Jason, who's like one of my oldest friends, is absolutely terrified of the Bell Witch. And it goes all the way back to when he was a kid. And I just thought it'd be hilarious to make a movie that would force him to essentially be in, in his worst nightmare for like <laughs> for like a week while we had to film it. So I was really excited about that opportunity. And, and just – and honestly, that story is really – really cool and it's never been there's never been just a straightforward documentary done about those those events that surrounded the bell witch story and it you know it doesn't it's it's got a lot of correlations to some of the the cryptid stuff we've covered in the fact that you know it's the story that blew up on a on a regional scale and there were posses and all that kind of stuff just like there are you know with a lot of the bigfoot stories we covered but yeah i think if we can keep jumping from not just um not just story to story but but moving around different subject matter like this you know paranormal cryptid ufological that kind of thing i think i think it helps us as a crew just just to stay engaged with what we're doing yeah. and what's what's funny is like if i'm I'll get away from from the Bigfoot stuff for a while. I think I said a dozen times while, while we were making on the trail of Bigfoot that it was like the last time I was going to cover Bigfoot. Um, but I find that like by the time I go and I do something else, you know, do a couple other stories. And, and this year we don't have anything really Bigfoot centric coming out in 2020. Um, you know, by next year I'm ready. Like I, I want to get back into it because that's the subject that I. I cannot get enough of, and I'd been dying to do something that really looked at 
you know, ufology as a, as a phenomenon. Um, so that, that's what on the trail of UFOs is. And we had to, we approached it. I feel bad. You guys only got to watch two episodes, but, but, um, I don't know if you'll, you could tell this or not, but like, I, I didn't want to approach it like I did on the trail of Bigfoot. I, I told on the trail of Bigfoot in this very like chronological sort of like PBS documentary style where, you know, it was, it starts with like the ape Canyon stuff and Albert Ostman and all that. And then it ends in the present day. And, um, I didn't want to do that with UFOs. I thought if it's going to be a longer series and I wanted each episode to sort of jump around chronologically and introduce, different aspects of the the phenomenon or the subject you didn't want to take a linear approach more like a thematic approach yeah Yeah. exactly yes yeah exactly and and do a a deeper dive into the into the entire subject so and and i mean if if anything the first episode begins where most series would end because it's like the the first episode of ufos is a look at where the subject is today like where it stands um but i kind of felt like i had to do that just to introduce an audience that might not be aware of all the ins and outs of how crazy everything's been over the last few years you know since like 2017 and how it's changed to the public's view of ufos and and the subject let's talk about that because um one of the things that you that you guys you have shannon legault state in the uh in the documentary is that, you know, there's some of the wonder that has been a part of the UFO field has kind of like gone away yeah. because, you know, the, well, of course the big announcement back in 2017, right. You know, that the government is, or the military admits that, Hey, there's weird inexplicable stuff in the sky. Mm-hmm. And since then there's been kind of this, uh, everybody has really, just gone to war with about this on yeah. Twitter over so any other kind of social media, yeah. especially on Twitter. Twitter is awful. Yeah. But it, so, you know, this is kind of like trying to get back to like the roots of like, you know, why do we have this sense of wonder about this? Why is this an important subject? What does it mean? Instead mm-hmm. of just talking about who is a secret agent and who isn't and, <laughs> All yeah. this kind of all this kind of stuff, which I think is you know can be valid as mm-hmm. a valid discussion. Sure. But I think people get bogged down into all that kind of minutia. Yeah, and the, and the the focus goes away from from the subject itself and the people that are at the heart of it. And so that was like that was our mission statement. There, there's on the trail of has been really different from our films because I'll find that I have like a a like a passionate response to just thinking about I'll sit down and I'll think about the subject and I get this like impassioned like mission statement in my head and like the other day I sent this whole Robert Frost poem to Mark Matsky who's going to be involved in helping me shoot on the trail of Bigfoot and I was like telling him you know like this is the mission statement I want to inspire people I want to do this <laughs> like I'm going down this list and I'm like I, I realize this sounds incredibly hokey but do not let me forget when I'm editing and sending you rough cuts that this is what I want it to be. And I, it was the same thing with on the trail of UFO. Shannon and I had this conversation on the drive, um, to when we were driving, um, out to Phoenix right after I had picked her up in Vegas and we were on our, on our drive to, to Phoenix from Vegas. And I said the, you know, in my head, every, every one of our projects is about something. It's not just about like the subject. It's not about, Momo. It's not about Minerva Monster. It's about there's something else at play, you know the the underlying theme. And to me, that the UFO subject, if you think about like the golden age of it, it would have been you know the 1940s and early 50s when people were just starting to like realize that these things were here um, on a large scale. And and very early on, before Hollywood really turned it into like the evil invaders from outer space. It, there was a genuine sort of wide-eyed optimism in looking into the subject. You know, like people were excited about the fact that there was this mystery. We didn't know what it was. We didn't think it was evil. It wasn't out to kill us. You know, it was just like there's something in the sky. We don't know what it is. And um, we've gotten and, – and I think like guys like Jacques Vallée have that same sort of approach still, like that same sort of like wide-eyed innocence about them. I don't know that people would agree with that, but that's that's my read on that guy. 
And um, so like it, it, people have just gotten so far away from that with the obsession with like Tom DeLonge and TTSA and, and uh, you know, infighting over whether or not it's all a government psyops or, or whatever. And, and there's just like, there's no focus on, on the subject itself. And I thought the perfect right. way to sort of set that up in that first episode was to, to, to use Dan Weiss. as our like focal point of that episode. So even though the episode is all about where the state of ufology is today, there's this guy who had a sighting that's sort of at the heart of that episode. And, you know, in a way it's saying like, look, this is, this, this guy is where we should be putting our focus. This guy, his experience, what he, what he experienced, not on, you know, uh, getting in a verbal battle on Twitter with someone who thinks Tom DeLong is a CIA spook, you know, like there's just, it just seems like it's all every everything's gone sideways to me, and I and and the right. other thing though, I, I get, told, yeah, I agree, I agree with that, I agree with that. I, I don't I don't want it to seem like we're preachy because we understand I understand like we're outsiders looking in on on this subject, and and there's a lot of people who've invested tons of time and effort into looking into the subject, who are a thousand times more knowledgeable than I'll ever be about it. And and they're passionate about what they're passionate about, and sometimes that manifests as anger and arguments and all that kind of stuff. So I get that, but at the same time, I just as as an outsider, I'm not really interested in what the the battles are that people are waging online. I just don't really care. And and I I'm the same way with like Bigfoot or any of this other stuff. I try I try to remain apart from the drama. I try not to keep like, to put myself in that stuff. Yeah, that's always a good thing. I mean, I think it's okay to have your own opinions about this stuff. Yeah, for I mean, sure. You know, if definitely. You, if, you know, whatever you feel is what you feel. I mean, I, I definitely have friends that are, you know, pro TTSA. I can barely say that. But, you know, it's like I, I have friends that are pro them and the whole ATIP stuff and all that. And, um, mm-hmm. You know, and then I have people that I know people that um, many of them on the show that, you know, vociferously disagree about it, but it's like, you know, you can, sure. you can be nice to each other at least. I mean, come on. It's just, yeah. not, it's just not that, it's just not that hard to be, to be nice, but people really uh, feel strongly about that. And that really um, tipped the balance on a lot of things in the UFO, in the UFO community. It really was like a, it's now like the 800 gorilla in pound gorilla in the room now right. in a right. lot of ways. Um, do you have any thoughts about all that? Oh yeah. Or any interest uh, in talking? I mean, did you reach out to like Tom DeLong to try to see if you could get him on or we, we actually, we actually did attempt, attempt yeah. that. Um, it's shockingly difficult to, to make any headway there. I mean, I guess it's not that shockingly difficult considering, like, you know, we're we're kind of nobody and, you know, we're definitely not um, – we, we haven't garnered the same sort of like mainstream press that some some of these other like documentary, like UFO documentary people have. Um, so we, we attempted to, to get that. At the end of the day though, you know, that episode isn't at all about that. It's not really about that. It, it originally was like in my head it was going to be much more about TTSA – and DeLong and, and Elizondo and all that. And really at the, at the end of the episode, that stuff is all in there and it's introduced in a way that it is simply, um, it's simply being, uh, I guess pointed to as like where, why it's important to the current state of the subject. It isn't really like a deep dive into all of that. You know, we could definitely do that down the road, but, but yeah. that episode is pretty much like, this is where the subject stands. This is one of the major events of the last, last few years. Um, you know, it's divided people. It, it's basically like a cliff notes version of, of that story. So I've got, I, I would have loved to have had that interview or whatever, but it didn't happen. And who's to say, you know, like I couldn't, convince someone yeah. to, to get it to get us an interview for like a season two if we can get that going because that's the you know i mean that's the thing about ufos too that's different from something like bigfoot is you could continue doing this current model that we have of episode by episode you know investigation into the subject topic by topic we could continue doing that for like 
season after season and not run out of things to explore because there's so much to ufology. Um, but yeah, if I don't know where I stand as far as I, I, it's funny, like coming into it, I think I had a pretty, I think it was pretty set in my head that, that DeLong and TTSA, it was probably all some sort of like government controlled campaign disinformation or information gathering campaign or something like that's kind of where I was coming into it. And, um, you know, we did talk to people who, who know those guys and we've heard a lot about it since obviously. And I'm not sure that's where I stand on any. You did get to talk to Greg Bishop. Good friend of our show. Bishop's awesome. Um, and Bishop is the heart of the series. Honestly, I, I told him the other day, I sent him the links and I was like, Hey, uh, just so you know, like I, you ended up playing probably the most vital role in the entire thing because I, any time I needed someone to turn the focus back to the witnesses, yeah, or or like add that sort of like emotional high note, he would have like the perfect thing to say, and um, so so I I definitely used him in episode one in that way, but he comes back throughout the series to do that same thing over and over again. I think he, you know, in episode. Episode five is all about like conspiracy theories, and he's throughout that episode. Just oh, kinda, nice, nice! Yeah, can't, just, can't wait to see it, man. Yeah, nice. yeah, that's our that's our Area Fifty One episode. So, um, yeah, he's he's he was really good. He was well. I'm guy. sure you talked about Paul Benowitz with him. We right? did. It's yeah. it's not in there though. It's not. Um, that's what I'm saying. Is like if if we can get a season two off the ground for this, we have we have so much unmined interview uh, footage to, to still get into. I mean, we did eight episodes uh, over four, over four and a half hours long, and we still have hours worth of interviews with almost everyone that we could still go back in and, and do more episodes. Um, so yeah, if we can, I want to do, I want to get like a conspiracies part two <laughs> and really get into, cause, cause I, I say it's a conspiracy episode, but it's more about secret government bases and cover ups than it is necessarily like the really out there conspiracy stuff. Yeah. But, but, but Benowitz, he talked about, um, yeah, he, he had all, all kind of great stuff to say. He, he even told, he told his own like personal sighting story, which is really fascinating because of the craft he saw being so weird. Um, and it, that didn't make it into the series either. So at some, you know, like I don't the, think I've the, ever asked him about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. He's, his is a really, it's a, it's super strange. The, the craft description, I can't remember it off the top of my head. I just remember it was really weird. Yeah. I got to go out with him. Uh, I was in California and I got to go with him and, uh, Walter Bosley out to the, uh, the Integratron area. Oh yeah. And, uh, saw the giant rock out there. Had a really, contact, made yeah. contact. No, no, no contact was made. Uh, darn. Some people were making contact. There's some people like to go over there and apparently do mushrooms. Yeah. So that sounds about right. <laughs> there's some other kinds of contact going on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, yeah. So I was I was very glad to see him in it. So who were some of the other people that you that you talked to in the uh, the documentary? Yeah, I mean, I think we we made a really conscious effort to to not to steer away from but not to really even bother contacting the big names in ufology for for one thing i don't know that those people would have said yes because they're going to assume we're some you know we make movies about cryptids and stuff they're going to probably never have heard of us and assume we have no idea what we're doing um but also i just didn't really just like when we made the bigfoot thing i i that isn't really who I want to hear from. I want to hear from the people that are like actively looking into the subject who are, who are doing investigations, who are, who are researching every day, who are really involved in looking into UFOs. And then I also wanted to talk to witnesses and experiencers, like people that are experiencing things or have experienced things. And so, um, you know, we interviewed Alejandro Rojas, uh, David Weatherly, um, Greg, uh, the first episode, I think we introduced sort of the, the the people that keep coming back throughout. So you get Stan Gordon in there, uh, Linda Zimmerman, who's an author and a researcher out of New York, who's great. Um, uh, Ryan Sprague is in there. Um, oh, yeah. There's just a lot of like a lot of people who are actively 
doing things that involve UFOs rather than appearing on like ancient aliens or whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's just like that. That wasn't what I was interested in. Um, so we, you know, I think my favorite interview overall was this guy named Ron Regeer. And Ron is, um, Ron was like the head of, of MUFON, um, in Utah at one point. Um, and he also worked for like McDonald Douglas and like all this. I mean, like he has a crazy background. Um, you know, he, he worked on like satellites, uh, for, for, you know, you'll, in episode two, he, t- he tells this crazy story about like tracking the Phoenix lights coming out of Area 51 because he was he was working some geosynchronous satellite at the time. And it's like this crazy story. And then we get to episode five and he's reintroduced again and he starts talking about how he was hanging out with Bob Lazar at Area 51. And I mean, he's just got like every every story he tells is is crazy just because he's so intricately tied into everything, but I'd never heard of this guy, you know, and I'm not a UFO expert by any means, but I think I, I have a decent grasp of who most people are and I'd never really heard of Ron. And, um, you know, like he was, he, he was one of my favorite interviews just cause he had so much insight into, into, um, all, all the key historical moments, but also just, he had all this insight as an investigator, like someone who had been looking into the subject for like 50 years, you know, and the Stan Gordon's that same way where they've just been looking into it for so long. Um, so there's, there's those guys. And then there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of witnesses and guys like Alexander Petikov and Sean Forker who are like tangentially sort of connected to u- ufology um, and small town monsters because Alexander directed our champ movie. <laughs> uh and so there was, I, I tried to, I tried to have a good mix. I know that at the, at the end of the shoot, we came away with 29 interviews, which is. That's impressive. Wow. That's, that's pretty crazy yeah. for, you know, for a shoot like this. And, uh, and I think, I think everyone was represented well. I hope they all feel that way. Some of them I'm still waiting to hear back. Um, but, you know, we had Micah Hanks's in episode six. Um, yeah. What's, what's Micah? What's What was he doing? He's, yeah, he's in there. Um, so we we met up with Micah on fittingly on Brown Mountain or overlooking Brown Mountain to talk okay. about the Brown Mountain lights. Episode okay. six is entirely about like mystery lights. Yeah. So so it's our yeah, that's uh, one of Micah's favorite places. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's our Brown Mountain light uh, episode. So we we met up with him kind of late in the evening, and uh, it was raining on and off. But we shot this interview with him and Shannon, and I think he's in the. You know, if I had it to do over again, what I would have liked to have done was to try to get a sit down with him. But we got into town so late. And as with everything, you know, we're in this crazy rush trying to get through everything and then get home. And um, so we were only with him for maybe like two hours. And and the entire uh, interview was basically him and Shannon just talking, you know. So if I if I had it to do over again, I would have like stuck him in a chair up there on Brown Mountain in the rain and just filmed that and had him kind of talk about all the different topics that we cover in the series because he would have been a great, you know, voice. And um but as it is, he's in that sixth episode and he he adds a lot to it. That's the that's the Micah episode. Oh, he does show up, his voice shows up briefly at the beginning of episode five for the uh I ran a clip of him talking about uh, the Storm Area 51 stuff. So he's in there. Cool. Yeah, that was a crazy thing. Did you guys go? Did you guys get into? You guys get into some of that though? About well, yeah, Storm I Area mean, 51. Did you guys? So did ever, you try? Because you're probably filming this around the same time that that was going that's on. That's the that's that's the, literally the episode starts with like an explanation of when we were driving to Area 51 because the day we were driving to Area 51 was the day that the story uh, broke about the Facebook group. It was the first whatever yeah. the first story was that sort of broke about that group, which was what sort of, you know, thrust it into the public view. Um, we were on our way to Area 51, like literally driving from Sedona to Area 51. We had no idea what was going on because we were in the middle of nowhere. So one of us thought it would be cool to start a Facebook Live on the Small Town Monsters page, you know, which our Small Town Monsters page on Facebook has like 40 some thousand 
people that like it. But, you know, when we do a live video, you get maybe like 50 people in there. And um, so, we, so we went live and within like 20 minutes, we had like 400 and some people and then it just kept escalating. I mean, at one time there was like four 4,000 some people were watching this live video and we're, we had no idea what was going on. We were being harassed incessantly with like jokes about clapping alien cheeks and and um and and karen and all the, all this kind of stuff we had no idea what was happening and uh eventually we shut the the feed off and then we realized like someone had shared our live video in that storm area 51 event page oh gosh and so that was our like introduction to storm area 51 was while we were on the drive to area 51 but what was funny was we got to area 51 and we, we met these guys and this in itself is strange. One of them was was blind, and he was wearing a that, that's not strange, but what 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 he was doing and sort of his look was strange. He was <clears throat> he had a GoPro um, strapped to him, and then he had um, you know he had his sunglasses on, and then his buddy was this retired um, military policeman who's like kind of fascinated by secret military installations. So they were driving to area 51, but they were doing it in a gray, uh, they were doing it in a silver 2019 Ford Explorer or not Explorer expedition. Is that it? I don't know the SUV. Anyway, it was the exact same SUV we had rented. So we both had the same vehicle and (laughs) we're in a convoy driving to the gates of area 51. I'm like, there's no way we're going to get like nuked off the face of the out here or something. It's like, it was the day where all of a sudden there's all these people saying they're going to storm area 51 and there's two identical vehicles driving to the gates. You know, it just seemed like a recipe for disaster. Um, but that was our, that was our Area 51 adventure. Nothing really happened. We got out there. We thought we were about to have a run-in with the uh, camo dudes, but it turned out it was just a happy-go-lucky family that that had driven all the way right up to the gates of of the uh, of Area 51. We had parked pretty far back, and we didn't want to get too close to it. A little worried that something might something bad might happen. Yeah, I mean, we we, we didn't know what the rules were out there. We had been told that like, you don't, you, you can't go past this one fence or something. Um, but you know, the family had driven right up to the gate and they were like touching the, the, the fence and stuff. And I was like, well, they haven't been shot yet. So we could probably do that. So we, so we, we went, we went down and did that as well. Did you make it to um, Roswell? Did we? No, no, we didn't. So that's what I'm saying is like Roswell, Roswell's one of those things we could get to in episode or in in season two. Um, it is talked about a lot in that same episode. The Area Fifty One episode actually gets into Roswell on and off throughout. Um, that that's probably of of the eight episodes. I think episode five is my favorite, the conspiracy one. I it's got a it's got a lot of energy in it, especially the way it it opens up. Um, but it's just like a really fun episode that kind of walks you through the the like conspiracy cover-up side of ufology so not i haven't seen that so what but what uh was there one conspiracy that kind of like stood out to you from that episode um, that you talked about that you found like more interesting than another i think we just spent so much time on area 51 and and lazar and all that kind of stuff so i mean it was just I think it's, I think it, that's my favorite part of it because of the fact that – well, OK. Hold on. That's my favorite part of it because we, we found all this – we were able to license all this 1950s footage from Area 51 that was sort of discovered right after the U.S. military acquired Groom Lake and all that. Oh, so cool. that in itself is awesome because you're getting to see Area 51 before it was infamous. Um, but then the other thing was the, the Tehran UFO – is is a focus in that episode for about uh four or five minutes we focus on the tehran ufo at the beginning of that that particular episode and that that also is super cool um because like with the groom link footage we also found a bunch of footage we could license of tehran uh in the 1970s and it was insane to me like how different things are you know in in iran today versus what they were in the 70s like in the 70s it was an insanely modern like it looks it looks like new york city or something but i don't know if you guys are familiar with that tehran ufo but i wasn't until we made this episode and it was super super fascinating especially because ron regeer was like one of the guys that was 
was able to track that UFO. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the most famous cases from like, yeah, I think seventy three. I want to say seventy three, seventy four, somewhere around there was when that yeah. was when that happened. Um, well, like I said, I'm an, I'm a complete newbie to this, so that for me was like that was I I just hadn't really I I had never heard of that particular incident, and it was it was really cool to to take in all the details from that one. I liked in the part the watched the first two parts, and I liked the where you talked about in the first part about kind of the progression mm-hmm. of what these things look like in the sky. So you, you do a good job talking about the airships. Yeah, that was cool. And you've got this progression into like the 40s and 50s and then up until the 80s and 90s where you get the triangular-shaped craft and all this kind yeah. of weird stuff. But, you know, you do make a really good point. I think one of the I think it's I think it's Rojas makes the point I believe, where he says I think he says that you know it seems that it the the phenomenon mirrors the technology like our technology that we have at the time. Yeah, um, that was my that was my question actually. Like I've I've had that question for a long time, so I asked I think I asked that question of most people. Um, it's like why do you think that is? Because it's always. It stood out to me like, you know, in the in the forties when you've got these literal nuts and bolts like airplanes in the sky, you know, everything's like steel and, and metal and all yeah. this stuff. Right. All of a sudden every you know, the, the craft that people are seeing are are really similar to that. And then you hit, you know, the the eighties and you've got the black triangles at a time when like the the stealth bombers are, are being tested and it's just it's just always stood out to me how the the technology you'd think if these were alien craft from another world they would sort of i mean they just stand completely apart and they do yeah, that's completely not to foreign say, yeah yeah that's not to say there aren't those cases it's just like it's always stood out to me that there's correlations in a lot of a lot of the cases to our technology this seems to be the nature of a lot of this phenomenon and not just with like the the, the ufo craft even though that is a really good example it seems that a lot of this phenomenon really mirrors our own kind of ideas and our own kind of things that are in popular culture mm-hmm. and that seems to be a very I mean, we, we, we beat the drum constantly on that on this show mm-hmm. but that that's a that's a big part of it i mean um walter bosley i don't know if you're familiar with him Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, Walter has a whole series of books now about, yeah. like, the airship mystery and yeah. all this. And, you know, th- there's that one idea. His idea is that, you know, you've got this breakaway civilization that started somewhere in the 19th century with this, with these airships. And that there's been this progression. And, of course, you know, that as their technology gets better, the the ships look better. They look sleeker. Right. But so there's that explanation, but I think there's the other explanation that is just a phenomenon that mirrors what we think that we wanted to see. And I know right. that you know you talk to Bishop, and Bishop you know is a huge proponent of his of the co-creation theory. And I think that there's definitely a a part of that to it. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, or just like, and then just in general, you know what what is it that you think that we're dealing with to, from doing the six part series and looking into this now and, yeah. you know, uh, so, so what I, th- some, someone said, someone asked me the other day, do you, do you think you know more now or less than you did when you came into it? And I said, definitely less because I, I came into it pretty, not, I, I mean, I, I've always been interested in UFOs even before Bigfoot, but, but mine, it's such a big subject. And, you know, like the more you digest, the more information you digest, I feel like the less I feel like I know about, about it. And and when you get into um, when you get into things like the abduction, episode seven's our abduction episode. And um, when you get into stuff like that, it 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 really qu- it makes you question everything you sort of have th- think, you know, to begin with, because the the abduction phenomenon on the surface is super dark and disturbing and and really weird and sort of um you know like i it's something we we weren't even sure we wanted to cover in this season um but then you talk to some of these people that have had these seemingly like terrible things happen to them and their families like we interviewed a guy whose kids were started started sort of suffering from from some of the abduction type experiences he was having he was he started seeing it manifested in his kids as well but he doesn't see the 
he doesn't see it as a negative. Like he sees it as a positive, positive. Even those kids are like waking up with bloody noses and stuff. Well, like how, why, yeah. you know, like why, why is that your response? And I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm saying like, I just don't have, I don't have any answers. And I think it, I think it's going to be a little bit of everything. You know, like I think there's a lot of like government manipulation going on. I think there's, um, I think there's potentially something to the 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 interdimensional idea. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of different stuff at play, and I think it it all when you get into like episode six, which is all about mystery lights, it just throws another wrench in the works because we we always sort of view mystery lights as like something completely separate, but if you really look at it, it isn't that different from no. from from you know UAPs. They're they're included in UAPs if we're calling them UAP. Um, so it's it, it's a subject that I want to keep looking into. You know, like with Bigfoot, I feel like where I'm at right now is I have my opinions on what it is. And I've and they're based on my own research into the subject and my own experiences. But with UFOs, I haven't experienced much. I had one thing happen to me years ago when I was with my dad, strangely enough, looking for Bigfoot. Um you know, but I, I can't even say that what I saw is like a traditional UFO. I saw a light in the, in the woods move up out of the woods, out of the trees, and then back down into the woods. Yeah. Um, but that's it. I, so I haven't even really experienced much for myself. And so I feel like I'm just starting to – you know, this is Shannon's story. And at the end, she says this is this is only the beginning. And that's kind of like where I'm at. Like I'm, I haven't even we, – we've just cracked the door open. We haven't even started to walk through yet. Yeah. When you get into the abduction stuff, and that's the real part that really fascinates me and has for a very long time, Mm -hmm. I personally, if I'm really looking at it, really see the abduction phenomenon as something that is apart from the UFO phenomenon. I Mm -hmm. I think it's been lumped in. Sure. Because of whatever popular culture or science fiction, you know, the idea that these must be crafts, so... A must follow B and the aliens must be coming out of them and they must be taking them back into them. Yeah. I I think what we're dealing with, with the abduction technology uh, phenomenon is something that has always been here Mm -hmm. and is just, you know, through the work of stuff like guys like Mike Cleland and Joshua Cutchin and the Jacques, you know, Jacques Vallée was one of the first people to really come up with this whole idea. Yeah. You've got these aspects of the abduction phenomenon that are very much, like what is in fairy lore very much like what the what the um in the muslim society they call the jinn yeah. you know these type of entities these type of creatures and there's so much similarity and i just think again once again it's a it's another phenomenon that is spitting back to us what we put into want, it what we put into it or what they think that we want to see and there's also this whole like you know sh- there's a shamanic aspect to it because the 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 closeness between what people see on like something like DMT ayahuasca and the mm-hmm. and the and the abduction phenomenon are very very similar mm-hmm. and that's that's that stuff is like what has always really fascinated me yeah yeah um we actually get into that um the phase stuff in in episode seven um one of the I'm trying to think of if you would have gotten to her introduction. I don't think so because I think she's introduced in episode three. But a good friend of mine, uh, Eleanor uh, Haskin, she's she's a PhD in folklore, and okay. she's throughout the series, starting with episode three, and she she really gets into like the Fae and um, and some of the some of the lore that that predates obviously the modern area of ufology that seems to deal with that you know abduction type stuff yeah it's 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 um that that is some of the most fascinating stuff um you should check out josh gutchen's work too um i've got i've got i've got his book because his uh his cover artist was sam sheeran who does our posters so oh Oh, yeah yeah right yeah yes he used to do the show with shannon that's right yeah into the yeah 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 um and he's in he's actually sam is in on the trail of ufos he's in uh episode four he uh he talks about a sighting that actually happened in los angeles oh nice yeah the urban area sightings are pretty interesting too um but yeah it's it's all fascinating stuff seth i really um 
I really appreciate your uh, you you what doing what you do. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask you real quick though about a little bit about the Mothman stuff, the flying yeah. humanoid stuff, man. Uh, that was uh, I actually watched that uh, not too long ago because we had Tobias Whalen on cool, talking yeah. about his book, uh, The Lake Michigan Mothman, and I was like, "What?" Well, I saw it on Amazon Prime. I'm like, "Well, perfect. I'll watch this." Yeah. Um, you know, that was a great documentary, and he's like, "That's you got some, you know, it, and and the Mothman stuff is so weird. It's so bizarre. Yeah, and it's weird. another one of these phenomenon that is like I think it's the same thing. It's spitting out what we want to see. But what, yeah. you got some thoughts about that phenomenon? Well, I mean, this is like the this is the year of Mothman for us because we're actually doing a project with Tobias um, that'll start filming here in the next few weeks called On the Trail of the Lake Michigan Mothman, which is going to be like a ninety minute special and follow him and his wife as they research or investigate these active cases, which is something we've never done with an STM project. So we're doing that. And then obviously we're doing the Mothman legacy, which is the follow up to the Mothman at Point Pleasant and looks at like all the modern day sightings. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, th- this is, uh, I hate to ride the fence on this stuff cause I know that's how it comes across as what I'm doing. But, um, when it comes to the Mothman, when I came into making the Mothman at Point Pleasant, I thought people had misidentified a large owl. And I also thought that they had been on some really crazy drugs and seen these smokestacks right across from the from the North Power Plant, which is where the first sightings happened. And if you look at those smokestacks through the trees at night, even if you're not high, they look – it looks like you're seeing two eyes and something with wings. Um This is Point Pleasant you're talking about? This is Point Pleasant, yeah. Yeah, But but after, like, really looking into that case and talking to witnesses and and hearing so much from the original witnesses, I came away with sort of a different opinion. It actually mirrors, like, the UFO thing, where I think it's a lot of different things happening. I think you've got some misidentification. I do think there were large owl in in the area at the time. I also think that the military was messing with people. And then I think you have something potentially unexplainable flying around the skies that people are seeing, but what it is and where it came from, I I have no idea. And I think that's where I'm starting to lean with the Lake Michigan stuff. If you watch, we made a movie last year called terror in the skies that, that is all about flying creatures around the state of Illinois. And there's about maybe 13, 14 minutes of that movie is dedicated to the Chicago Mothman. And yeah. at, at, at the time I did not think there was anything to the Chicago Mothman. And, and I, that was based on my, interaction with a lot of those people uh a lot of the other you know investigators and authors and stuff we interviewed the one person who was like insistent that there was something to it was tobias and i've stuck with tobias over the last like two years and i not stuck with him but i I follow his work and i'm interested in what he's doing and the guy has never let up in saying there's something here beyond just misidentification and hoaxing and um and, I, and I'm starting to lean in that direction, especially after reading his book. And um, Yeah. It's an extensive so, book. I mean, he's really well-researched it. I mean, he's got a lot of cases in it. So much so, I was reading it, and I was like, man, how many more of these am I going to read? <laughs> yeah. Thing? It is. But it, that's that's what you got to do it, though. Because if you don't do it that way, I think the skeptics will eat you alive. Yeah. No, he's he's super, super cool and, and really, really doing, like, some good work. In, in that area. So I'm, I'm excited to keep looking into the Lake Michigan stuff. I don't know where I'm going to come down on it. I know when it comes to the, to, to the Appalachian Mothman, to the West Virginia Mothman, there's more to it than just, there's more to it than I think I've had a chance to really, um, process. There's, there's, there's a history, a Celtic history in, in West Virginia, um, that, that where their legends and lore point to multiple beings that that could very easily be a forerunner for something like the Mothman, even if we're talking about something like the like banshees and things like that. So there's there's more to it than I think I've had a chance to really process, and we're we're really just getting started with making uh, the Mothman legacy. We've got about six of our interviews shot. We've got a bunch more to do. Um, and, I, and some of these other interviews so far, we've just interviewed um, 
eyewitnesses. So once we really get into like talking to some of the, we have interviews lined up with like native local native Americans. We have uh, folklorist interviews, um, Appalachian historians, things like that. Once I, once I really get into that stuff, I think I'll be able to, to maybe make a more educated, uh, that, that is going to be really interesting. Cause I don't think anybody's taken that tack before with the Mothman stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's where, that's where we were wanting to go with it. Cause we've already done the Mothman, you know, the Mothman in Point Pleasant was a pretty concise look at the 66, 67 stuff, but it didn't stop there regardless of what a lot of people like to say. And, um, so we're going to follow the, the sightings up to the present day and, and the sightings that we're taking, the people, were, the interviews we're, we're getting, they're not standard. It's a really big mix of types of encounters. You know, you've you've got the classic kind of like Mothman glimpsed out the, out of a car taking off into the sky, but you've also got a four foot tall Mothman that flies through a wall uh, shortly before one of our witnesses' fathers dies. You know, like there, there's yeah, just some some so really weird. weird weird stuff going on, and and the history and and Appalachian lore that that kind of stuff appeals me to me because I'm I'm from that area. Right. You know, I'm from right. I'm from neo i'm from northeast ohio and we're right on that line and uh and i'm from east tennessee Tennessee, yeah well i was just gonna say i have family in the deep woods of north carolina right by right by east tennessee so i'm in that i'm in that that uh my my grandpa uh breedlove's family is from from way down there like um shoot i just read his obituary today i completely forget the name of the town but it's like just south of uh just south of like gatlinburg Okay. So it's like it's like so, we're right in that area. Sevierville? It's not Sevierville. I know Sevierville okay. though. There's yeah. a really good restaurant in Sevierville. But yeah. It's a pretty area. Cool, man. I I just wanna say I really what I really like about the brand is that it kinda all centers around this connection to place mm-hmm. and and the legends that are that belong to these places yeah and uh you know that's a real cool part about the american landscape that we're all really interested in awesome yeah that's 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 what draws me into it is the is that like sense of place and and even like with the episodes trying to create that atmosphere with, yeah that, that that's one thing i miss when we get really deep into like on the trail of on the trail of doesn't really ha- have that mm-hmm. but the films like i i love that they're just you know, like we're in this one area and we can really let that, you know, grow. And, and hopefully that each, each, each film has such a different sort of like atmosphere to it. That's try to, all try to capture it. Yeah. Yeah. That's all really intentional. Oh, right, Seth. Well, awesome, man. We know you got to get rolling, but, um, can you tell people, uh, where they can find your films, where they're available? And again, when on the trail of UFOs is going to be available for, I guess, purchase and, is it going to stream uh, anywhere? Yeah. yeah um, so smalltownmonsters.com um, has like a link to the web store and you can pre-order Blu-ray or DVD. I would highly suggest Blu-ray because these are, we, we went all out with the series and there's like a, we, we hired a colorist and I think the scenery is really gorgeous. Um, there, they will be streaming for sure. They'll be streaming on Amazon and Vimeo on demand if you want like a DRM free copy. But we are working on a wide release for this. I'm just not sure if and when it will happen, but it is in the works. Like literally, I'll have answers t- tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but uh, if nothing else, it'll definitely be on Amazon and, and Vimeo on demand. And then um, the Kickstarter is still going on too. I don't know when this episode is going to drop, but the Kickstarter runs for nine more days. So it ends on March uh fifth so if you want this will be out before then uh, yeah if you want to back um that's that's a good way to get access to everything we're putting out through the year including on the trail of the lake michigan mothman and you can get like rewards there's shirts and uh, there's a 200 page coffee table book about small town monsters that we're doing as well nice that's a part of that kickstarter so yeah if uh and you can get your name in the credits of the movies so oh yeah there you go all right seth it's been an honor to speak to you man we're gonna to have to get you back on uh soon um but uh we're gonna close this up we'll be right back to close out the show on conspiracy normal We 
marathoned it tonight, guys. We really oh, did. Yeah. That was. I think that might have been a podcasting first. What was that? Because uh, we went on, we did our show with Seth Breedlove and found out that Seth was going on to Strange Familiars with Timothy Renner, that that was the next show he was going on. And I texted Tim to let him know that we we got him on and uh, Tim suggested we come on with, <laughs> with Seth. So we just immediately switched over to Strange Familiars. Just kept it rolling. <laughs> It just kept everything going. So you got, I don't know. I think, I don't know when Tim's episode is going to be out. It might be out before ours, but you know, whatever. But uh, you guys are kind of get a double shot um, of, uh, of of extra part of that interview with uh, Seth Breedlove continued on to the strange familiars podcast as well. So um, just briefly, you went someplace interesting this last weekend. Yeah, I went down to uh, North Georgia to Somerville, and uh, me and my girl stayed at the uh, at an Airbnb on the property of Howard Finster's Paradise yeah. Garden, which he was he was like a uh, visionary preacher and pretty much a contactee. He had a real strange experience in 1982, and he painted a lot of UFOs to real famous folk artists. So it was really cool. And then we went to. Uh, rock city and saw the you didn't see seven states uh, yeah i don't know about all that but we did see the fairyland caverns yeah under there so that was that was pretty weird there's like all this these black light painted gnomes and kind of creepy creepy stuff if um if you don't know who our fencer is um if you're an rem are a Talking Heads fan. Uh, He did the album cover for Little Creatures for Talking Heads. And I think Reckoning was the album cover he did for R.E.M. Or they used it. And apparently the the, uh, video for Radio Free Europe was filmed at Paradise Gardens. And uh, all the way back in like the early '80s. So that's that's who Howard Finster was. I think that's interesting that he has a contactee. Uh, connection because that's something that when I went there, like I think I visited there in like 1998 because you know I'm from Chattanooga, so it's not too far away from there. I didn't know about all that whole connection. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting place. I think it's in like close to Somerville, Georgia. I think Tryon, Georgia. It's in Somerville. Yeah. Um, so guys, uh, tickets for Strange Realities Conference by this point should be up. Um, we are we at this moment are trying to get those get all that together but uh guys we've got uh it is going to happen september 25th and 26th of 2020 here in at sir nashville in nashville tennessee if coronavirus doesn't kill everybody or they don't shut nashville down because of it before then so uh this is the lineup that we've got going on right now we've got tim banal brent rains arian gully aaron gullius guy malone angelia sheer jerry abland timothy renner who we just were on his show and dr future is going to be there and also we got alan greenfield uh the author of secret cipher the euphonauts is going to be there as well so come all star come join us and of course you guys are going to hear about it from now all the way till september at infinitum because we really want you to come to nashville for the strange realities conference 2020 september 25th through 26th of this year all right well that uh, takes care of that uh Seraphiel, tell everybody where they can find patreon and what we got going on over there you can find us at patreon.com slash conspiranormal and of course we've got content every week now including something we were recorded today about that popular mechanics article that everyone's talking about about ufos and uh so yeah you can also make a one-time donation at conspiranormal.com uh, please give us reviews and feedback. Let us know what you're really into. We really appreciate it. And just sharing stuff on social media, whatever. We've been getting some really great fan feedback lately, and it, it really inspires us. Absolutely. All right, guys. That's it uh, on Conspiranormal.
you would like to help the show, please consider becoming a Patreon at www.patreon.com slash conspiranormal or leave a one-time donation at conspiranormal.com. And please check out our YouTube channel, Conspiranormal Podcast.